and up and down and left and right. Want to build your own voice controlled web app like that? Let's do it. What's happening guys? In this video, we're going to be taking a look and extending our previous video where we started building speech command recognition for our web apps with TensorFlow.js. And we're actually gonna use that to actually control on-screen elements. So you'll actually be able to see different elements on the screen being controlled by our voice. Pretty sick, right? Let's take a deeper look as to what we'll be going through. So in this video, we're going to be covering three key things. First up, what we're going to do is we're going to be leveraging our existing speech command recognition app that we built in a previous video, and I'll show you how to get access to that. Then what we're going to do is we're going to be leveraging speech commands to actually control on screen elements. So we'll actually have a ball that's on our screen and we'll be able to control it just using our voice. Pretty cool, right? What we're then going to do is work out how to handle that state and reset that state so that we can pass through multiple of the same command. So if I say right, I want it to be able to move right, but I want to be able to say right again so that it continues moving right. So in order to do that, we need to reset our speech command state. Let's take a look as to how this is all going to fit together. So first up, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be grabbing the existing TensorFlow.js code and the existing React code. We're then going to make a couple of updates as to how we handle our state. And we're also going to build up our visualization function. So we'll be able to see our ball moving across our screen. Now, this is obviously working with a visualization and we're moving a ball, but this could be a whole bunch of different things. So say, for example, you wanted to control different functions that are triggered as a result of these speech commands being passed through. You could definitely do that with this code. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. Alrighty, so in order to build our React app that allows us to control on-screen elements, we're going to be using a couple of key things. So first up, what we're going to be doing is working with React, and we specifically built up the previous app that, we work, or that we're going to be working with using the create React app command. We're also going to be using TensorFlow.js, and specifically from here, we're going to be using the speech command recognition model. In terms of actually building up our app, we're actually going to be starting up with the existing speech command recognition app that we built in a previous video. I'll include a link somewhere above and in the description below. So in that video, what we did is we built up a React app that allows us to use our microphone to pass through speech commands to it. So this allowed us to actually go and say, one, two, three, left, right, up and down, and actually have that detected on screen through our browser. So pretty cool, right? So it takes a wave pattern and actually converts that and detects what is actually being said. Now, again, all the code for this video is going to be available inside of the description below via GitHub. So if you want to pick it up, you can also go through to github.com forward slash Nick Knock Knack forward slash speech command recognition dash control on screen elements. So what we're actually going to be doing in this video is we're going to take our previous app and we're going to extend on from it. So rather than just displaying a word to the screen, we're actually going to start moving around on screen elements and taking a look at what that looks like. So what we're first up going to do is we're actually going to grab this existing package. So let's copy this link. And again, the link will be in the description below. And we're actually going to clone that repository. So in order to do that, so I'm just I'm inside an existing folder. So in order to do that, I'm just going to type in git clone and then paste in the link and download that. Perfect, so we've now got that, so we can take what's take a look at what's in that folder. So in this case, you can see that we've got our application there. So we can CD into that, and then we can open it up inside of a code editor. In this case, I've opened it up inside of VS Code, so you can see that we've got the majority of our code that we wrote in our previous video all already in there. So let's first up start out by testing this out. So in order to do that, we first up need to install all of our dependencies. Now there's nothing new that we need to install for this particular video. We just need to go on ahead and install our existing stuff because when we upload it to GitHub or when I upload it to GitHub, I don't actually include all of the dependencies. So let's install it. So by running npm, let's make that a little bit bigger, npm install, which you can see down here. And we'll be right back in a second once that's all installed. Alrighty, so our dependencies are now installed and you can see that it took 129 seconds to go and install that. So what we can now do is actually start up our app and take a look to see if it's still working. Now, if you watched the previous video, you would have noted that for certain commands, the model potentially didn't perform that well. What we can actually do is we can actually drop down our probability threshold, and this is going to make it a little bit more flexible, particularly if you've got a strong Australian accent like me, this is going to make it work a little bit better. So what we're going to do in order to kick off our app is just type in npm start, and this is going to start up our application. 
And uh, ideally it should open up a new browser and then we'll be able to hit our command button and pass through a command. So we'll also in open up our console. Perfect, all right, so a key thing to note here is that our model has loaded. So remember, whenever we load up this model, we're going to have a command that actually says model loaded or we're actually gonna console log it out. So if I open this up, what actually happens, just a quick recap on this actual application is when our model starts, it runs this load model function or when our application starts, it runs this load model function, which is going to console log out model loaded. Then ideally, once we go and hit the command button, which is down here, this is actually going to go on ahead and start our recognize commands function. So this is actually going to start listening for commands that we actually pass through. So ideally now what we're going to do, this might look a little bit different to what was shown in that previous video. The code is the same. I think the number of steps are a little bit different between when I recorded it and when I put it up on GitHub, but the code is all the same. It'll work exactly the same. So what we're now going to do is test this out. So if we jump back to our app, so again, mind my Australian accent. So it might pick up some really, really well, might not pick some others up. So if we pass through our command, we're going to go uh, left, right, up, down. Left, right, up, down. Okay, so you can see that that's appropriately picked up all of our different commands. Now, what we're actually going to do is actually start working with this to start controlling on-screen elements. Now, in terms of what we're actually going to do in this video, there's a couple of key things. So if we go back to our readme, let's go and update this. So there's four things that we need to do. So in terms of the on-screen elements that we're going to be working with, we're actually going to set up a canvas and try to draw a ball. And what we're going to do with our speech commands is move around that ball on the screen. So ideally we want to be able to move it left, right, up and down and change its size based on a number that we pass through. So if we pass through one, we want it to be small. If we pass through 10 or nine, we want it to start getting bigger. So the first thing that we need to do is actually start drawing our ball. So if we go to our app.js file, we're going to start defining this function. So what we're actually going to do from here is we're actually going to import our draw ball function. Now we haven't actually written this, so let's just create a placeholder. Let's actually copy over our steps. And if we're continuing on from this numbering, then we really should be starting off from three. So this is really going to be step four, step five, step six, step seven. Okay, now I think the numbering in the previous video was a little bit different, but you sort of get the idea. So we're kicking off from the listen actions bit. And really, I think we had a separate step for the, the on-screen elements, but that's all fine. So what we're now going to do is start by drawing our ball. Now we're actually gonna create a new file called utilities, and we're actually gonna define our draw ball function in here. So let's actually go on ahead and do it. Okay, so that's our template draw ball function set up. So to our draw ball function, oh, so let's quickly take a look at this. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be exporting it, which means we're going to need to import it inside of curly braces, created a new function called draw ball. And to that, we're going to be passing through our canvas again, which we need to set up our X coordinate, our Y coordinate and our radius. So this is going to define how large our ball is, our X position and our Y position as well. Now, what we actually need to do is actually go on ahead and draw this to the screen. So we're gonna set up our function and then we're actually gonna bring it back into our app.js file. All right, so that's our draw ball function done. So again, we're using our canvas elements to go on ahead and draw this. So first up, we're beginning our path using canvas or ctx.begin path. Then we're actually drawing our circle. And to do that, we're just using the standard arc functionality. We're passing through our X value, our Y value, our R, which is our radius. Uh, I believe this is our, or these two are our start and end angles. Then what we're doing is we're setting the color. So by doing that, we're using ctx.fill style and we're setting it to aqua. So if you wanted to change the different colors, you could definitely do that there. And then we're filling up our ball. All right, cool. So that's that now done. Now, what we can do is actually bring this in to our app.js file over under our draw ball step. So let's go on ahead and do that.
Alrighty, so that's our draw ball function created and now imported. So we can actually go back to our readme and mark this off as done. Now, the next thing that we wanna do is actually go on ahead and set up our canvas. So what we actually wanna do is be able to draw our ball onto our canvas within our application. So what we're going to do is grab this to do item and we're actually gonna bring it down to this section here inside of this return function. So what we're actually gonna be doing is updating our on-screen elements. So let's go on ahead and do it. We're also going to be commenting out this section of code because we don't need that anymore. And then we're going to set up our canvas on the top of that. Okay, so that is our canvas now set up. So there's one key thing that we need to define it to fix this and make sure it works and that's our canvas ref, but more on that in a second. So what we've gone and done is created a new canvas tag down here. We've created a couple of parameters. So to that we're passing through a ref. So we're gonna be able to refer to this up inside of our code up here, but we're actually gonna define that in a second. So by defining our reference, this is going to allow our React app to work with our on-screen elements. Then we've just defined some styling. So nothing super crazy there. So we'll set margin left to auto, margin right to auto, left, right to zero, text align to center, our set our Z index, and we've also set our width and our height. Now what we need to do is actually go on ahead and define this reference. So we're going to scroll right up to here and under step six, this is where we're going to start setting up our canvas ref. So just on that note though, we have set up our canvas so we can actually jump back to our readme and mark that as done. Let's go on ahead and set up our canvas ref and we're also going to set up our X, Y and R states while we're at it. Now, in order to do that, we're going to be using our use state and we also need to import use ref up here as well. Okay, cool, let's do it. Alrighty, so those are our different references and our states are now set up. So we've gone and written four lines of code there plus also importing use ref up here. So if we take a quick look, what we've gone and done is we've written these four lines of code. So first up, we've created a reference and this is our canvas reference. So whenever we wanna work with our canvas inside of our straight up JavaScript or React code, we're able to type in canvas ref current and this is going to allow us to grab our canvas and work with it. And this is particularly important when we start actually using our draw ball function to draw onto the canvas. Then we've also gone and set up our different states for our X, Y, and R values. So what's actually going to be able to happen is we're going to be able to say left and we're going to move left. So this means that we're going to be adjusting our X value. We can say move up and this is going to move our ball upwards. And in order to do that, what we're really doing is we're adjusting our Y coordinate. Then we can also say one, two, three, four, whatever, and so on. And this is going to adjust our R, which means it's going to adjust how big our ball is, right? So this tutorial is obviously focused around how to control on-screen elements, but really you could do quite a fair bit with this. So you could um, change the color of your background. You could change a whole bunch of other stuff. You could even trigger different functions, so on and so forth. Okay, cool. So that is step six now done. So we can now mark that as done as well. Now, now we're up to the nitty gritty. So updating our ball state. So there's quite a fair bit to write in here. So let's take a step by step. So first up, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be defining a number map. So this is basically a JavaScript object that maps the word number. Or so say for example, Z-E-R-O. We wanna be able to map Z-E-R-O, which is the command that we're getting back from our speech recognition model to the number zero, because we actually wanna work with the, the numerical number. So let's go on ahead and define that and then we'll take a look.
Alrighty, so that is our number map done. So what we've basically gone and defined there is the word and the numerical mapping. So zero equals zero, one equals one, two equals two, and so forth. So the reason that we're doing this is when we get our command back, we're actually gonna get the label, so the word, and we actually wanna get the number. And we're gonna use this to define our radius for our ball. So ideally, if we pass through five, we wanna be able to increase that radius up by five, multiplied by some multiplier. So, but more on that in a second. So the next thing that we need to do is actually go and define our function that's going to go on ahead and update our on-screen elements. So we're going to wrap this inside of a use effect hook and we're going to create an anonymous function like so. And then what we're actually going to do is we're actually going to listen for any changes to our action. So when we pass through an action using our microphone, what's actually happening is inside of our recognize commands function, we're going and actually updating the action which our microphone detects. Now that is actually stored inside, of, if you watched the previous video, that is actually gonna be stored inside of a variable called action down here. So what we actually wanna be able to do is respond to a change in that particular action. Now I'm actually gonna grab this code and I'm gonna take it down a little bit. So if we start out from up here, Let's put it down, put it in slightly more chronological order. So we actually want to put it down, or we'll put it around here. So what's actually going to happen here is once we go and detect that command, if we go and change that action, then this particular function or this anonymous function in here is going to be triggered. So that's sort of in concert with how we want our app to work. If we change command or if we detect a different command, we want to be able to go and update what our canvas actually looks like. All right, so let's go on and start defining this function down here inside of our use effect wrap. Alrighty, so that's one long line of code there. So let's actually take a look at what we've written there. And I'm actually gonna space this out onto separate lines to make it a little bit easier to understand. If we actually step this out. Okay, so what's actually happening here is we're basically checking what the action or what the current action state is. So assuming our action changes, we wanna detect what action it's actually moved to. So if our action is up, what we're doing is we're setting our Y coordinate. And because of the way the canvas works, by subtracting Y, this actually means we're moving it up. So we're taking our existing Y value and we're subtracting 10 to move it up. If our action is down, then we're adding 10 and this is moving our ball or effectively our, our draw ball function. We're moving that ball function down. If it's left, then we're moving it left by subtracting 10 from our X value. And this is over here. And if it's right, then we're adding 10 to our X value to be able to move it right. And this whole thing over here is basically just one big stacked ternary. So our question mark is basically allowing us to say, if action is up, then do this. If it's not, which is this column here, then is it down, then do this. If it's not, then is it left, do this. If it's not that, then do, is it right, then do this. If it's none of those at all, then it's just blank. And after that, what we'll do is we'll check for the size. So whether or not we're passing through a numerical number. But rather than doing our number yet, I think it's time to actually start testing this out. So we'll actually use our draw ball function or finish that up now and actually start taking a look at what this looks like on the screen. So let's wrap this up to a state where we can actually go in ahead and draw stuff to the screen and take a look at what that looks like. Okay, so that is our function pseudo done. So basically we should be at the state now where if we run this, we're able to move our ball around. So I've written five additional lines of code there. So basically first up what we're doing is we're setting our canvas width and height. So we're explicitly setting the width and height, not just the styling. And to do that, we've written canvas ref dot current dot width equals 600, canvas ref dot current dot height equals 600. 
Then what we're doing is we're getting the current context. So we need to grab this in order to be able to draw to our screen. So in order to do that, we've written canvasref.current.getContext and we're grabbing the 2D context and we're storing that in a variable called CTX. Then just for good measure, we're console logging our X, Y, and our R. Then we're passing through our context, our X, Y, and our R values to our draw ball function. And if you remember correctly, our draw ball function is going to go on ahead and draw a circle to our screen. I've called it draw ball, could be called draw circle. So ideally what should happen now is when we go and hit command, we're going to be able to see a ball drawn, drawn into our screen and we should be able to move it around with our mic. So let's go on ahead and test this out and see how we're going. So I'm going to jump over to our command line. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And I'm just gonna type in npm start. npm start there and kick that off. All right, so remember on our screen, and it looks like we've got an error, and let's check that out. Equals, uh, we shouldn't have an equals there. So this down here should be a colon. Let's try that now. Uh, we've got another error there. React use state, or use ref cannot be called at the top level. So maybe we've done that outside. Let's take a quick look. All right, so a few errors there. So what happened was we had this uh, use state and use ref section outside. So if I take that back outside, let's take a look at that error again. And so it's basically saying that React use state React and the refs shouldn't be outside of this app function. So we just need to grab this and bring it down into here. And we also had a typo right about down here, this Z index needed a colon. So make sure that's a colon there and you won't get any error. So let's just save this and see if we're working. So it looks like it's all running. So if we now jump back over to our app, you can see that we've got a ball drawn to our screen. Yes, but we actually wanna do something with this, right? It's not that great right now. So we actually need to do something. So if we go to our console, what we wanna do is actually run this command and take a look and see if we're able to move it left and right. So if we go and try that out, up, down, left, right, right, left, right, down. So what's actually happening is because we are setting our state and it's not actually moving, we're not actually able to get a multiple step movement. So if I say up and the state is already up, we're not actually triggering that action to move it up in a particular direction. So what we actually wanna do is we wanna reset our state back to something other than up to be able to move it up. So if we jump back to our code, what we can do down here is after we draw it, we can set our action and we'll just pass through something random, right? So base. So this will allow us to pass through up multiple times and actually go up multiple times. So if we hit save, so now our action should reset to base. So if we reload this, up, 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 there you go. So we're now working right. So as we're saying up, we're moving up. And if we pass through a different command, up, we shouldn't hit it twice. Left, right, down, up. And there you go. So we're actually moving pretty accurately now. So we're moving up, down, left, right. So let's try it again. Up, 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 down, 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 left, left, right. Pretty sweet, eh? So that's actually going and doing a reasonable amount of control there. But the last thing that we actually wanna be able to do is actually change the size of the ball, right? So we're moving up, down, left, right. And we played around with this set Y function. So basically minus is going to move it up, plus it's gonna move it down. What we now wanna do is be able to change the actual size. Now remember our size is controlled based on our R value. So if we actually now go and use this number map, so if we pass through a number command, we can basically change that pretty easily. So let's go on ahead and make that last update. Oh, let's quickly take a look at our readme. So we've gone and done our ball, we've done our canvas, updated our canvas ref. Now the last thing to do is finalize our ball state. So let's do that. So what we can then do is update R and let's go on ahead and write this code.
Okay, so that's our update R function done. So what we've basically done is we've gone and checked whether or not our action is inside of our number map, so specifically our word-based command. And in order to do this, we've written if object.keys number map includes our action. So what we're then going to do is trigger this next line. So we're getting our number map, we're passing through our word-based action, and we're getting the number. So basically, if we pass through the command three, then we're going to be returning the number three. And then we're multiplying that by 10, just to make sure we're able to see those changes and we're passing that through to the set R method. So this is then going to go and change our R, which gets passed through to our draw ball method down here. Now, the last thing that we wanna do is actually disable the time-based command. So ideally, we just want this to run so we can keep moving around our ball till our heart's content. And in order to do that, we can just comment out this set timeout. So basically, once we hit command, it's not going to stop listening. You can leave this running if you want, but it basically means that you're gonna to need to hit command every time you want to run it. So if we save that now, it doesn't look like we've got any errors. And if we now go back to our app, reload for good measure, models loaded, that looks fine. So let's go ahead and issue some commands. So let's test out our left, right, up and down first, and then we'll test out some numbers. Left, left, right, right. That looks like it might have already hit a number. Four, three, two, nine up 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 down 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 left left one nine so you can see that we're now able to change our ball state so we're able to move it up we're able to move it down we're able to move it left and right pretty cool right and so we've gone and triggered zero there so if we actually go and sit nine you can see it's coming back. So this allows us to do quite a fair bit of things. Now, in this case, we're only controlling an on-screen element, but think about the possibilities. You could actually do quite a fair bit with this. So in this case, we're controlling a drawing, but you might choose to say a giraffe and have it draw a giraffe or something like that. But that about wraps it up. So if we actually go back and take a look at our to-do list now, we've now gone and updated that. So we've gone and effectively updated our ball state. So we took our baseline app, we defined our draw ball function, we then passed through our different actions and commands in order to control our on-screen element. Now, do remember that all of this code is gonna be available on GitHub, so if you wanna just try it out, you can just hit npm install and npm start and you can actually start running this in real time. And that about wraps it up. Thanks again for tuning in guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell so you get notified of when I release future videos. And let me know how you went about recognizing different commands and controlling on-screen elements and what you're going to be using this for in the future. Thanks again for tuning in, peace.